uh, just a quick, uh, quickly before we start, I just want to note to everyone, if you haven't yet noticed, um, the midterm sample questions are up on Georgia View. They're in the syllabus and assignments folder, right? Just see, there we go, right at the bottom. World Lit 2 sample midterm questions. Um, they're fairly broad. Um, basically, they just cover, you know, sort of broad themes that we've discussed in the course. Their intent is to show you what sorts of things generally I want you to know, the sorts of things I want you to be conversant with when you take the exam. Um, the actual exam questions will be more specific and may require you to refer to specific texts, um, but this will at least give you a, a good basis for studying, right? So if you look over the sample questions, maybe you know, do a practice essay here and there, that'll prepare you pretty well for the exam itself. Does anybody have any questions about the exam or about the paper before we proceed? No? All right, great. So um, just briefly, um, if you go home and you look in the folder on memoir and the literature of sentiments, there are a couple of things here related to Rousseau. Um, I got two podcasts here. The first one on the top um, is by a Cambridge history professor named Melissa Lane uh, talking about um, Rousseau's view of civilization and society, uh, which we'll get into more detail about um, as we start talking about the text. Um, at the bottom, we have another of these In Our Time BBC podcasts, which covers Rousseau's uh, theory of the social contract, which we were talking about last time, but which is still relevant to this particular work. The other two things I have posted are articles. Um, the first is by a philosophy lecturer at the um, University of Sussex in England. Um, and he's talking about the confessions as a psychological autobiography. Right, as sort of Rousseau plumbing the depths of his own personality and psychology, which would have been a very new sort of thing to do at the end of the 18th century. And the other article is mostly about uh, the aims and purposes of the Confessions. Um, it's written by DJ Wright, DG Wright of the University of Toronto. All right, so um, the music that you heard as you were coming in today was actually written uh, by Rousseau. Among other things, he was also a composer he invented a new system of musical notation uh, that he spent a good part of his life trying to get other people to adopt. No one did. Uh, but Rousseau is one of history's great late bloomers. Um, he was a teenage runaway from Switzerland who worked a number of low-level domestic service jobs um, footman, valet, secretary, um, for various noble houses. He worked as a music teacher off and on well into his 30s when he finally fell in with a group of writers and philosophers in Paris that included people like Voltaire, Diderot, and he first made his reputation as a contributor to Diderot's encyclopedia. And this is sort of where he begins making a living as a writer, right? living by his pen, rather than sort of jumping from crappy job to crappy job to crappy job. So was there anything in particular that struck you? about this text that struck you about the confessions. Yeah, James. <clears throat> he kind of sprout, like he really showed he really felt bad about what he did to Mary. Mary and he like mm -hmm. had that guilt carrying over him the whole time that he didn't just step up and say, Yeah, I took it instead of lying. 
Yeah, he does provide us with a number of episodes that show him in a really unflattering light, right? And the Marion episode really makes him look like a turd. You had a hand up, Brittany? Were you going to say something? Um, to me, he just kind of seemed like he was um, more concerned with being ashamed, like people shaming him and calling him certain names. Uh -huh. Whether than being worried about being punished. For certain things that he did. Yeah. Uh-huh. And both of these actually have to do with um, with Rousseau's larger theory of human nature. Right? So let's look at that Marion episode a little bit more closely. What's the build up to this? Give me some context. <laughs> yeah, he takes a ribbon. And he gets caught. He steals a ribbon from the household of this noble woman he's been working for who's just died. And it's just, it's just a shitty little ribbon, right? It's no big deal. There's nothing special about it. But he takes it anyway. Why did he take it? He wanted to give it to her. Yeah. He, his <coughs> express purpose, right? is to give it to her, right? But he keeps telling us that he is a person of good character. So what is it that drives him to steal? What's the household he's been serving in like? What are the people he's been working with like? If we go to page 69, Can I get somebody to read that, that full paragraph in the middle of the page? It starts with, I think that. Can I get a volunteer here? Yeah, Brittany, go for it. I think that this was my first experience of having a lot of play of hidden self-interest, which has so often impeded me in life, and which has left me with a very natural aversion towards the apparent order that produces it. I don't know that name. Heir, <laughs> since she had no children, was a nephew. The Comte de la Roque. Was, who was assiduous in his attentions toward her. In addition, her principal servants, seeing that her end was near, was determined not to be forgotten. And all in all, she was surrounded by so many overzealous people that it was unlikely that she would find time to think of me. The head of her household was a certain inlorizing and artful man whose wife, feeling more artfully, had so insinuated herself into the good graces of her mistress that she was treated by her as a friend rather than a paid servant. She had persuaded her to take on a, as a chambermaid a niece of hers called Pontel, a crafty little creature who gave herself the airs of a lady's maid. Together, she and her aunt were so successful at ingratiating themselves with their mistress that she saw only through her eyes, their eyes, and acted only through their agency. I had not the good fortune to find favor with these three people. I obeyed them, but I did not serve them. I did not see why, as well as attending our common mistress, I should be a servant to her servant. I presented, moreover, something of a threat to them. They could see very well that I was not in my rightful place. They feared that Madame would see it too, and that what she might do to rectify this would diminish their own inheritance. For people of that sort are too greedy to be fair, and look upon any legacy made to others as the of them of what is properly theirs. And so they, they, so they made a concerted effort to keep me out of her sight. She liked writing letters. It was a welcome distraction for someone in her condition. They discouraged it and persuaded her doctor to oppose it on the grounds that it was too tiring for her. On the pretext that I did not understand my duties, they hired in my place two great oaths to carry her about in her chair. And in short, they were so successful in all this that when she came to make her will, I had not even entered her room during the whole the previous week. It is true that thereafter I entered as before and was more assiduous in my attentions than anyone else, for the poor woman's sufferings distressed me greatly. While the constancy with which she bore them inspired admiration and affection in me, indeed, I shed genuine tears in that room, unnoticed by her or by anyone else. Okay, thank you. So, there's an opposition set up in this paragraph between the other servants in the household, the people who run the household, and Rousseau himself, right? What, are, what does Rousseau call his own tears? Genuine. They're genuine, right? They're the product of real feeling. 
Now, what words does he use to describe these other people, the Lorenzinis and Mademoiselle Pantal? Well, greedy is one, right? But if we look at this other list of things that he says about them, right? Artful. They behave artfully. They're crafty. They put on airs. What does it mean to be artful? Creative. It, well, in the positive sense, right? Like, okay, you know, someone who is artful is someone who is skilled at making artificial things, right? So what he's referring to is their lack of genuine feeling. That these are people who are tricky, who are deceptive. So he's been plopped down here in a bad environment. He's working and living amongst people who are selfish, who are nasty, who are false. While he himself is a man of good character and genuine emotion. So what is it then that leads him to steal? He's surrounded by bad influences. Rousseau believes that human beings, in their natural state, before they enter society, are good. Are good, are honest, are pure, are innocent. And that it's society, it's civilization, that corrupts people. And in this case, he's fallen into particularly bad society. Right, so it's the company he's forced to keep in this house that turns him into a thief. Now, it's his affection for Marion the cook that leads him to steal the ribbon, right? But the influence of these nasty people, the Lorenzinis, who are selfish and grasping and care only for what they can get out of their mistress, warps his natural good feelings, his natural positive feelings, and causes him to do something wicked. Right? Causes him and not only to steal, but then to deny it and to blame the girl, right? To keep himself out of trouble. So, on the one hand, this is an act of sort of explanation, self-justification, and apology, right? I feel really, really bad that I did this all those years ago when I was young and stupid. Right, he's writing this as an old man looking back on his life. <laughs> but he also makes some attempts to justify and explain his actions and to bring them into line with a general philosophical principle. His idea of the natural man as opposed to the cultivated or civilized man. In fact, he actually tends to associate, Rousseau has um, some particularly regressive gender attitudes. Um, he tends to associate naturalness with masculinity and cultivation, civilization with femininity, right? His narrative is littered with cultured women who are um, very intelligent, very educated, very witty, but also false. Rather like Madame, Madame de Versailles, right, his mistress here, the woman he's been working for, writing letters for, who is very intelligent but doesn't seem to feel anything, right? The thing he notes about her is her indifference. So anything else that you notice in this that you particularly want? Do we see this particular pattern playing out elsewhere in the Confessions? 
where the influence of others warps natural feelings into something other. Yeah, Brittany. <coughs> Okay, yeah, he, he has this, yeah, this, this funny little memory, right, of when he was a little boy and he peed in the neighbor's tea kettle, right? Now, what he is um, remembering there, what he's pointing out there is like, as a child, when I was still at home and exposed only to members of my own family, my pranks were relatively innocent, right? You know, tell that to the woman who had her tea kettle pissed in. But what he's trying to point out there is like, the relative harmlessness of his childhood pranks, his childhood activities. Now, where do we see a sort of counterexample? Like he's loved and read to and coddled, right? Do we see a counterexample in his own household? If we look on page 61, that second paragraph, I had a brother, seven years older than I, who was learning my father's trade. The extreme affection that was lavished upon me meant that he was a little neglected, which is not something of which I can approve. His upbringing suffered in consequence. He fell into dissolute ways even before the age at which one can, properly speaking, be considered dissolute. He was placed, uh, he was placed with a new master from whom he ran away just as he had done at home. I hardly ever saw him. I can hardly claim to have known him, but I nevertheless loved him, and he loved me too, and as far as such a rascal is capable of love. I remember once when my father, in a rage, was chastising him severely, throwing myself impetuously between the two of them and flinging my arms around him. I thus protected him by taking on my own body all the blows destined for him, and I kept this up so determinedly that my father was obliged in the end to spare him, either because he was moved by my cries and my tears, or because he was afraid of hurting me more than him. My brother went from bad to worse, and the end ran off and disappeared forever. A little while later, we heard that he was in Germany. He never once wrote. No more was ever heard of him, and so it was that I became an only son. So how is the treatment Rousseau's older brother receives different from the treatment he receives? What is the brother subjected to that little Jean-Jacques is not? Neglect. <laughs> Neglect and violence, right? Yes. We never once hear here of Rousseau himself being beaten. Right? He and his father just sit up all night reading books together. But this beating, right, this capital punishment, right, inflicting pain upon a child, this warps the older brother's character. He becomes dissolute. He refuses to stick in a job, right? He won't remain in his apprenticeship. He runs away and falls into bad company. So why this focus on the influence of things done to children, things that happen in childhood? This would have been in Rousseau's own time, a really, really weird thing to focus on. There were such things as autobiographies when this was, uh, when the first part of this was first published in 1782, but they didn't look like this. There were basically two kinds of autobiography that Rousseau would have read and been familiar with. The first, would have been a sort of spiritual autobiography. Rousseau's model for this would have been something like uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine, which is a conversion narrative, right, where Augustine slowly and surely comes to you know, confess his sins to God and renounce you know, his previous ways and become a Christian. The second type of autobiography Rousseau would have been familiar with 
it is the sort of great person, great deeds narrative. Right? A famous nobleman or a military general or you know, a great admiral, a great scholar, you know, somebody writing a book that's basically a record of their achievements, the great things they've done. Now one thing that neither of these types of autobiography would have done is focus much on childhood. Childhood is usually glossed over in these narratives in a couple of pages. Right, maybe a couple of paragraphs even, right? I was born here. This is who my father and mother were. I will provide you with one example of how precocious I was as a youth, right? Something that showed I was destined for great things. And then I'll move on to talk about my adult life. Childhood doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. Uh, Rousseau's own uh, acquaintance, uh, Denis Diderot, in his autobiography, only mentions one incident from his childhood. He remembers coming home from school with an armload of academic prizes that he won and how proud his father was of him. And that's all he tells you about his childhood, just one incident that shows he's destined for great things. Now part of this is because, particularly in the West, like childhood as a category is a fairly recent historical development. People didn't used to think of children as really being anything other than little adults. Right? You were, a, you were an adult in training. That was it. You know, maybe you, you go to school instead of working if you're of the proper class. But by and large, you're not regarded as much different from an adult. Now, what is Rousseau trying to demonstrate by focusing so much on childhood. Childhood shapes you. Yeah, the things that happen to you when you're a child, exactly, follow you into adulthood. Right? The things that impress upon your mind when you're a child affect the kind of adult you become. Right? And what's the clearest example of that in this narrative. What's one of the embarrassing revelations he makes? Uh, the getting spanked when he yeah, <clears throat> yeah, he makes this confession of his own sort of feelings of masochism, right? That he says results from being, a, you know, a, a physical punishment by a pretty young woman when he was a child. Right, that this one instance of physical punishment affects his sexual tastes and his sexual proclivities for the rest of his life. Right? So yeah, these things that happen in childhood, this is one of the reasons why he's willing to reveal these kinds of embarrassing stories, right, is to demonstrate this particular principle. Childhood matters. And the things that are done to you, the things you experience when you're a child, shape your personality. One of the works he was most famous for before um, he wrote the Confessions is called Emile, or On Education. And it's both a novel and a polemic. Right, he's making an argument for a particular kind of natural education that doesn't expose children to books too early, that de-emphasizes corporal punishments, um, that sort of allows children to grow into adulthood in a relatively natural kind of way. Right, so all of this is in accordance with Rousseau's educational theories is theories of human development. Right. <clears throat> Letting people just be natural is good. Punishing people and forcing them to conform to social strictures is bad. Now, <clears throat> how many of you 
have any particular feelings or associations with the word capital R romanticism. What does this word mean? What are we talking about when we talk about romanticism? Um, why, why would you say fantasy? Because it's fantasizing about how things should be like you want to be, and it's not real, realistic. It's not. That's the way we tend to. I guess that, that's the, the, one of the ways we tend to use the word now, right? Is that someone who is a romantic is someone who is a dreamer, right? Someone who's not realistic. Um, someone who, for whatever reason, just, you know, is, operates mostly outside of the real world, right? If we're talking about artistic romanticism, what are we talking about? What sorts of writers, what sorts of artists do we, do we associate with this kind of romanticism? Byron, Shelley. Okay, yeah. Blake. Yep. Coleridge. Okay. So you've got a big list of English poets here. What do they what do they have in common with each other? Why do we regard these poets as romantic? Because that's what we learn in another class. <laughs> There's an emphasis on nature and feeling mm -hmm. the individual. Yeah. Yeah, we tend to think of romantic artists as nature artists, but there's a little twist to that we'll get to in a moment. They are much more focused on individuals and on individual psychology than previous generations of writers were. If we think about um, the neoclassical works that we looked at, we think about Voltaire and Moliere <laughs> and these previous French writers, their concerns are in a lot of ways pretty different. Right? A neoclassical writer, by and large, isn't interested in people as individuals. People are types. <coughs> Characters are types. Right? If we think back to something like Tartuffe or to Candide, right, all of the characters are basically some sort of allegorical type. They don't really have individual personalities. Right? They're so typed that a character like Pangloss like, can't break out of his, upset, his fixation on optimism, even though it's constantly disproved in front of his eyes. They're much more interested in human beings in society and human social life, right? People interacting with other people than they are in the individual mind, the individual soul. They are anti-superstitious. No ghosts, no goblins, no fairies. None of that. Fixated on reason. And they believe that literature is essentially an art or a craft that can be learned. Right? Anybody can do it. You just have to learn the proper techniques. You have to learn the jargon. You have to learn the conventions. And just like any other craft, any other art, any other profession, anybody can then go ahead and do this. Romanticism aims to turn most of this over on its head. Right? For a romantic, individual inspiration is what's important. So their adherence to form is often less rigid. 
than you will find in neoclassical authors. They are also very much interested in the actual psychology of single people, ordinary people, people who are in some way well-rounded. They also like to bring the ghosts and goblins and fairies back. You will find all sorts of things like haunted castles and uh, ships full of zombies and um, things of that nature in uh, Coleridge, for example. And this nature thing is also really important. Like, while we tend to think of romanticism as nature art, nature poetry, nature is really um, just a kind of catalyst. Nature, for a romantic, is something that spurs thought. Right? You go out into the wilderness and you see some sort of glorious waterfall or you know, a great craggy mountain or storm clouds rolling in, right? and it inspires you in some way. Right? It gets you thinking about things. So what romanticism is really about is less nature and more the activity of thought. It's often more about how human beings process information, how your mind takes in sensations and does something with them, right? processes them. So yeah, the real subject of most romantic art is actually human thought. Now, Rousseau provides a very early example of this sort of thing. Rousseau is not a romantic per se. There wouldn't really have been such a thing. <coughs> but he is reacting against a lot of the philosophical and artistic strictures of neoclassicism. Right, so he got to Paris, he got to be friendly with people like Diderot and Voltaire, but they didn't really um, see eye to eye. And eventually he falls out with the rest of this group. And in 1764, A pamphlet starts circulating. The pamphlet is called, what is it? I have it here somewhere. Sentiments of the Citizens. And the Sentiments of the Citizens attacks Rousseau specifically for debauchery, for madness, ingratitude, and inhuman behavior, and reveals several embarrassing facts about him. For example, that he consigned all five of his children to an orphanage as soon as they were born. Now, Rousseau suspects, rightly, that the author of this attack on him is his old frenemy, Voltaire. He'd already been mulling over the idea of an autobiography. And this spurs him to complete it, and to move it in a different direction than he might otherwise have taken. So let's look at the very beginning of what we got here. If you look on page 58, the beginning of part, uh, book one, part one. Can I get a volunteer actually to uh, read this, starting with I am resolved? Yeah, James, go for it. I am resolved of an undertaking that has no model and will have no imitator. I want to show my fellow man, fellow man, a man in all the truth of nature, and this man is to be myself. Myself alone, I feel my heart and I know men. 
I am not made like any that I have seen. I venture to believe that I was not made like any that exist. If I am not more deserving, at least I am different. As to whether nature did well or ill to break the, mo the mood in which I cast, that is something no one can judge until after they have read me. Let the trumpet of judgment sound when it will. I will present myself with this book in my hand before the supreme judge. I will say boldly, here is what I have done, what I have thought, what I was. I have told the good and the bad with equal frankness. I have concealed nothing that was ill, added nothing that was good, and if I have sometimes used some indifferent ornament, uh, ornamentation, this has only ever been to fill a void occasion by my lack of memory. I may have supposed to be <clears throat> true what I knew could have never, what could have been, so, uh, Never what I knew to be false. Never what I knew to be false. I have shown myself as as I was contemptible and vile when that is how I was good, generous, sublime when that is how I was. I have disclosed my innermost self as you all alone know it to be. A symbol about me, <coughs> eternal being, the numberless host of my fellow. Mm -hmm. Let them hear my confessions, let them groan at my unworthiness, let them blush at my wretchedness. Let each of them here on the, here on the steps of your throne in turn reveal his heart with the same sincerity. And then let one of them say to you, if he dares, I was better than that man. All right, thank you, James. All right, so what does this reveal to us about his purpose? If we think about the traditional spiritual autobiography, Right, that's a confession of one's sins to God. Is Rousseau making confession here to God? Who, to whom is he confessing? Yeah, to his fellow men, right? He asks God to assemble his fellow men, right? But the message is not here for the supreme being. The message is for other people. The focus here is on other people. So it's a confession to his fellow men. What else do you notice about this? What, how, does this how does this little preamble here strike you? And why? Yeah, go ahead, James. I kind of feel like he's saying, well, if we're going to throw out what I've done wrong, we're at least let me do it, and I'll tell you exactly what happened. If you like mm -hmm. what you do, if you don't, you don't. But that's yeah. really what happened. It is a means of taking control of the narrative, right? This is my story. I will tell it as I choose. I will leave nothing out on purpose. You can trust me to be honest or to at least try to be honest insofar as I'm capable of, of being so. But hear it from my own lips, not from the lips of my enemies. Anything else in here that seems to accord with any particular principles we've talked about? Uh, How does he seem to regard, oh, go ahead, Sarah. I was just gonna say there's an emphasis on his Sincerity and genuineness, uh -huh. even though he's been defamed. Yeah. They're saying all these nasty things about me. You can trust me to be right. I am sincere. I am genuine. I am basically good. Right? What about in terms of attitudes typical of romanticism? What's the first thing he says to us in this uh, little preamble? We'll have no imitator. Okay, yeah. This undertaking will have no imitator and it has no model, right? So he claims to be doing something that has never been done before. No one has ever written something like this before. So it's that romantic focus on innovation, right? Not following tradition breaking down old models, making something new. 
I want to show my fellow men a man in all the truth of nature, and this man is to be myself. Myself alone. I feel my heart, and I know men. I am not made like any that I have seen. I venture to believe that I was not made like any that exist. If I am not more deserving, at least I am different. As to whether nature did well or ill to break the mold in which I was cast, that is something no one can judge until after they have read me. So why is he, pardon me, the best person to tell his own story? Yeah, he's the only one who has access to the inner self, right? A biography can only focus on external actions, observable behaviors. An autobiography of the sort that Rousseau proposes actually digs into the inner self. And what's going to be special about his story? What's so special about Jean-Jacques Rousseau's story? Let the trumpet of judgment sound when it will. I will present myself with this book in my hand before the Supreme Judge. I will say boldly, here is what I have done. Here is what I have thought, what I was. I have told the good and the bad with equal frankness. I have concealed nothing that was ill, added nothing that was good, and if I have sometimes used some indifferent ornamentation, this has, only been, this has only been to fill a void occasioned by my lack of memory. I may have supposed to be true what I knew could have never been so, never what I knew to be false. I have shown myself as I was, contemptible and vile when that is how I was, good, generous, sublime when that is how I was. I have disclosed my innermost self as you know me to be. And the end of the paragraph says, let one of them say to you if he dares, I was better than that man. Now, is he trumpeting his own superiority to other people? No. What's he doing here? What's the rhetorical strategy? He's going to give you reasons why he thinks he's like, he's just going to tell you his life honestly, and they want you to look at yours and reflect and compare him. Exactly. Yep. This is my story, right? It's unique. It's not like anyone else's story. No better or worse, right? Anyone in this room, if you were to write your autobiography, right, you would all have a different story, right? Casey's story would not be Melandria's story. Melandria's story would not be Noah's story, right? Because no one else has access to your inner self, to your inner essence. So what he aims to do here is plumb the depths of his own experience to figure out how he became what he is and to explain to you, to justify to you, his readers, what he is and who he is. And this didn't, um, this didn't go over real well with a lot of his contemporaries. Um, while he is mostly focused on himself and his own actions, one of the problems with autobiography is that um, you're writing about the self operating in a world of other real people. And sometimes those other real people have themselves behaved in ways that were not admirable, right? Sometimes they have done shitty things to you or to others. And if you are being completely frank and honest, you are also going to report the terrible things other people have done, right? So he had never intended these memoirs for publication because he knew that could get him in trouble. So what he started doing in 1770 was giving private readings of them in the homes of people he believed he could trust. This was actually a small number of people. Rousseau was, among other things, extremely paranoid. Even these private readings, though, upset his friends enough that several of them called for the police to come in and put a stop to them. So <clears throat> none of this got out to the public until several years after Rousseau's own death. Right? The first part of his memoirs is published in 1782. The remainder are published in 1789. 
So his self-justification doesn't actually reach the fellow men to whom he wanted to speak until about a decade after he, di after he died. So if that doesn't make you sad, what will? All right, so does anybody have any questions about, it, about any of this? I mean, like, this is just, this is, it's a short excerpt. We've covered most of the major points he's trying to make and the tradition this is operating in. Um, so if you don't have any further questions or comments, I'm okay with, you know, we got, what, like, maybe 10 minutes to go. I'm okay with letting you go a little bit early. So why don't I just, I'll give you the reading questions for the Equiano. Um, I'll pass back your last set of in-class writings. And I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>